Good morning and a very warm welcome to this, our Palm Sunday service at Regent Street Presbyterian Church. Wherever you're joining us from, you're very welcome. I have a few announcements for you this morning, um, so we'll get started with a couple of reminders from last week. The first one is that on the 4th of April, which is Easter Sunday, we will be worshipping here in the church building. We will be gathered together, but we will be under the normal restrictions that you are aware of. Um, I'll not go over them all again this morning. The only one I will remind you of is that you do have to pre-register for the service, and you can do this by contacting the church office, either by telephone or by email. Uh, the service we are hoping will be live streamed, so for those folks that don't make it to church, hopefully you will get it uh, on, on the usual platform where you would watch the recorded services. Uh, the Easter Sunday morning service will be conducted by the Reverend John C. Wright. The second thing I want to remind you about is the Holy Week series of services which are hosted by four different churches here in Newton Ards. These services are online. They start at 7 p.m. Uh, in the evening from the 30th of March, from Tuesday the 30th of March, right through each evening until Friday the 2nd of April, which is Good Friday. Now, we have, there will be a link on our church website, and also we will be, the same as last week, putting up all the details uh, about what is, what is happening in the services at the end of this, on your screen at the end of this service this morning. Usually around this time of the year, um, the different presbyteries have services showing you the work of the Council for Mission in Ireland. Now, obviously this year such rallies aren't possible, uh, but we have moved to an online service for this. The service is introduced by the Reverend John McConaughey and will give an insight into all the aspects of the Council's work in Ireland. And there will also be a message in the service uh, from God's Word from the Reverend Frank Seller. There is a link again on our church website to this service. Um, and I would commend the service to you just to see the work that the Council for Mission in Ireland does do in Northern Ireland. Our next service will be on Good Friday. That's the 2nd of April. The Good Friday service, again, will be a recorded online service, and it will be available to you from 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon. So if you want to watch it as an afternoon service or you want to leave it to an evening service, it is entirely up to you, but it will be available from 3 p.m. And the service will be conducted by the Reverend De Dennis Campbell. Which brings me to this morning and our service this morning for Palm Sunday will be conducted by the Reverend Dr. Donald Watts. And I'm sure uh, we are all looking forward to joining with Donald in worship on such an important Sunday. Donald, you are very welcome. Well, thank you once again for your welcome, Ian. Hopefully this will be the last Sunday when worship is entirely online. But from wherever you're watching us today, you're very welcome as we come to worship God.
This, of course, is Palm Sunday, the day we remember Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem, it seemed, in triumph. The crowds were already there from all over the world, gathered for the Passover festival. As they approached the temple, preparing for the feast, the crowds would sing and shout for joy, often from the Psalms. One of them was Psalm 118. Listen to these words. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let us pray. Eternal God, we know that your love for us endures forever. There's so much going on which is troubling and uncertain in our lives, but your love is secure. You are our God, and we will praise you. You are our God, and we will exalt you. We have experienced your love in so many ways, even through the dark challenges of the past year. When we've been saddened or frightened, your Spirit has come to uphold us and give us strength. When we've become disillusioned through the endless days of lockdown, your Spirit has refreshed us and renewed our hope. As the seasons have passed with regularity, we've been encouraged by every sign that in you we are secure. Once again, we delight in the signs of spring and the promise of brighter days to come. Creator God, in your love you sent Jesus to the world for all of your creation. This week we pause to remember just what he endured for us. He was misunderstood, ill-treated, betrayed, crucified, but he accepted it for us. Although we say that we are grateful, too often in our lives we do not reflect our gratefulness. We do not truly live for Jesus. Forgive us, Lord. We do not allow his spirit to reign in our lives. Forgive us when, like the disciples, we have not totally relied on him. Forgive us when, like the crowd, we have been fickle. Forgive us when, like some of the religious leaders, we have protected our own interests rather than acting in obedience to you. Help us to use this Holy Week as a time of true reflection on the enormity of Jesus coming into the world, emptying himself of all but love. May your Spirit draw us close to him, even through challenge, so may we discover the wonder of life in all its fullness. Amen. Now a time for the younger people. Hello boys and girls, or as you used to be saying, Space Cadets. Max and I usually see you at Space Academy, but today... Gavin has asked us to do another children's address this morning, except I can't seem to find Max. Oh, Max! Here I am, Davy! Sorry I'm late. I was just chatting to... Davy, what on earth have you done? Do you like it, Max? How much did all this cost? Well, I just thought it'd be nice for all the... Davy, did you talk to Jack the Treasurer about this? 
Well, yes. I mean, look, Max, we haven't got time for all this. Oh, oh, sorry, Gibby. Now, what does Captain want us to talk about in this morning's children's address? Well, the last time we spoke to him, he said he wanted us to because talk I about... Because I've got a list of things I thought we could talk about with the children. Yes, but Max, I don't think... Like how Ireland are the best rugby team ever, Gibby, and beat England only last weekend. Max, I don't think you should... And like how I'm back to school, and Mrs. Bell said I had grown so much since she had seen me last, and... Yes, very good, Max, but... Oh, how about the fact that Johnny Bell turned only 27 last week? Well, at least that's what he's telling everybody else. Max, you can't talk like that. I can't? No. Well, how about I read some of my fan mail to the boys and girls? Oh, dear Max, I think you're so handsome on Space Academy, and you're my favourite. Love, Joe Max. Max, we've not come here to talk to the children about your fan mail. Oh, dear Diddy, why not? Because that's not what Gavin's plan was for us. He left us very clear instructions. Oh, dear Diddy, it's just... I thought it would be better if we did something different. You know, did the children's address my way? Yes, but Max, your way isn't always the best way. That's true, Gibby. Sometimes it gets me off track or into a lot of trouble. Exactly. In fact, last week at Space Academy, we've been learning about someone who went against God's plan for him. Do you remember, Max? <gasps> of course, Gibby. His name was Jonah, and he didn't agree with God's plan that he should go to Nineveh, so he ran away. But then he realised God's plan was right all along, and God had a plan for the people of Nineveh as well. Oh, oh, and Davy, just this past Friday, we learned all about David, didn't we? That's right, Max. And how, even though he didn't look like very much, and very much like a king, he was, because he trusted in God's plan for him. And because he knew God's plan for him was the right path, he managed to beat the Philistines and Goliath. He did! But Davy, what did Gavin want us to talk about this morning? Ah, well, Max, God's plan goes further than some of the people we were just talking about. In fact, we're very close to a holiday that reminds us all of a plan he had for his son, Jesus. That's right! Easter! God sent his son Jesus down to earth and had a plan for him to save us from sin. You've got it, Max. Jesus died on the cross for our sin, but he rose again defeating death, even death on the cross. And thus, God's plan was the right one. Exactly, Max. And God has a plan for you, me, and everyone watching. You're right, Gibby. And you can find out more by watching Space Academy. You sure can. But for now, let's go to our prayers. Our God is a great big God.
We read Luke's account of Jesus' entry to Jerusalem at the beginning of this very significant week, which led to his death. Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 44, will be read by Joan Hamilton. Today's reading is taken from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 44, the triumphal entry. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. Amen. Thank you, Joan. Let us again join in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this week which we call holy, a time to reflect on how much you care for us, how completely you were prepared to give yourself for us. We know that every day is holy because each day you come to reveal a little of yourself and to show us that you care. We thank you for the many ways, both great and small, that you have come to be alongside us, especially during this time of pandemic. We think of the ways you have supported us in the last week, and we give you our thanks. We know that often you act on earth through other people, And so we thank you for those who have been alongside us to help provide for our needs. Our family members, people who have made deliveries, doctors and health workers, those who are providing vaccines and others who in simple ways have made our lives more comfortable. We know, Lord God, that you act through them. May we also make ourselves available to all who are in need. We pray for those who are worried just now, perhaps with symptoms or in a hospital. We think of families who do not have the contact that they would long for at such a critical time. We remember so many health and care workers who work through exhaustion to give support to those who need them. Healing Lord, may you be alongside all who need your touch today. We remember those throughout the world for whom COVID is only one additional worry in their fragile lives. Today especially, we think of the situation in Myanmar and the enormous 
number of refugees among the Rohingya people. As they come to terms with the devastating fire destroying their flimsy camp, may they be comforted and may the world recognise that you demand justice for all your children on earth. We pray for those who are in leadership in this country and beyond. May they be given your vision of cooperation and support for one another. Especially may the distribution of vaccines be fair and not limited to the rich and powerful. We pray for the witness of your church at this time. May we be always able to encourage one another. As those for whom it is appropriate begin to enjoy meeting together again, may we recognize the things that are truly important in proclaiming your gospel. Help us not just to harp back to the past, but to move forward with confidence, knowing that you are ahead of us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It seems really strange to, once again, be celebrating Palm Sunday today with no one, no one in church. Of all days, surely this is a day for crowds, for excitement, for jubilation. This is one of the great celebrations of the Christian year as we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And yet perhaps, just as in the past year we've had to rethink so many of the things that are important in our lives, perhaps this is an opportunity to rethink what is the real importance of this special day. We may lack being together in celebration, but we can reflect on the story of Jesus entry to the great city surrounded by crowds and yet you know it seems that Jesus wasn't really all that impressed by the crowds thronging around him. I find it interesting that in Luke's account Jesus started his journey to Jerusalem alone. Verse 28 reads After Jesus had said this, he went on 
ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Another translation says, ahead of them, ahead of the disciples even. Which seems an intriguing kind of a detail. Why did Luke think it was important to tell us that Jesus started the day alone, ahead? Perhaps it was to remind us that as Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was moving into a phase of his life when more and more he would be alone. Jesus was going to enter the city in a special way, a way that clearly referred back to Old Testament prophecy, singling him out as the messianic leader sent by God. And while it may have seemed that in doing so, Jesus had the support of his disciples, that support wasn't going to last forever. For all the crowd surrounding Jesus that day, he would face the challenges of the week ahead increasingly alone. We often find in the Gospels that Jesus goes ahead of the disciples making preparations in ways that they hadn't even thought about. In a storm on Lake Galilee when they thought they were all alone, he was there already. On a lonely hillside, when they had no idea how to feed the people, Jesus knew. And so as they entered Jerusalem, the climax of their journey up from Galilee, Jesus was ahead, preparing the way. Perhaps most significantly of all, on Easter morning, when the message to the disciples came from the angel, I have gone ahead of you to Galilee. Luke constantly wants to remind us that in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, however challenging the way ahead may seem for us, Jesus is ahead of us, making preparations for our journey. Surely that's a thought worth holding on to. As we make, struggle to make sense of a pandemic, as we worry about how children will cope when they get back to school, as we try to visualize what church life may be like in the future, I suppose especially here in Regent Street during a time of vacancy, Luke is telling us very clearly that Jesus knows about all our uncertainties, even our failures, and he is ahead of us, preparing for our futures. Luke doesn't really make clear when it was that the disciples caught up with Jesus. Perhaps he was, in fact, only a little distance ahead, because by the time they were approaching Bethphage and Bethany, it seems they were all together again. The actual entry into Jerusalem is, of course, full of Old Testament prophetic symbolism. But Jesus was very specific in the prophecy he wanted to focus on. We know that most of the prophets looked forward to a powerful Messiah, a Messiah who had come with real strength to overthrow Israel's oppressors and restore the city of Jerusalem to its former glory. And that's surely what the people of Jerusalem expected. They'd been waiting for it for generations. It's also, I think, what the disciples thought Jesus would be doing. But Jesus models his entry into Jerusalem on the prophecy of Zechariah. And that tells of a different style of leadership. One who had entered Zion, he calls it Jerusalem, it's the same place, meekly, humbly riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Listen now to these words. Rejoice, 
greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. In entering Jerusalem, Jesus wanted people to know that yes, he was the Messiah. He was sent as a leader by God. But he wasn't the political Messiah that they were all expecting. His revolution, rather, was one of people's hearts and minds, calling them humbly to turn back to God. Jesus wanted to be clear that he was fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy of a lowly, humble, but righteous king riding into the city and bringing peace. And so, of course, if he was to do that, he needed a colt, a young donkey, never ridden on before. So where, you might ask, would the disciples, strangers from far away Galilee, find just such an animal? Of course, Jesus had it all prepared. He was, indeed, ahead of them. The two disciples whom he sent to a nearby village simply had to follow through on what he told them. There'd be no questions asked. Don't we need to learn that when life for us takes an unexpected turn, when perhaps the situation around us becomes confusing, even frightening. Jesus is always ahead, preparing the way. There is only one challenge for us, and that is to listen and to follow. He is ahead of us. The crowds on that day did join with the disciples to cheer their king into Jerusalem. We may wonder in the light of subsequent events just how much they understood. Crowds, after all, are fickle at the best of times. But in this Palm Sunday, the people celebrated with sufficient enthusiasm, clearly, to annoy their religious leaders, or some of them, the Pharisees. It was they who told Jesus to keep his disciples under control, to keep them quiet. His reply, if they keep quiet, the stones themselves will cry out. See, the Pharisees were trying to control the events in Jerusalem by silencing people. It's a technique which the powerful still use today. It rarely works for long. Because voices, ideas, beliefs, they will break through. They will be heard. Leaders, even today, need to understand that. But you know, that is particularly true of the gospel. Sometimes we may feel a little defeated by life around us. We may think that... The life of Jesus is not understood the way it once was, that the wonder of his coming to earth is not celebrated today as it might once have been. But what Jesus was pointing out as he entered Jerusalem was that nothing can silence his gospel. The events in Jerusalem that week were of such significance that even creation itself, the stones around him, would not be silent. You see, Jesus' death and resurrection is the pivotal moment of God's activity in the world. That will be known. 
however people may try to keep it quiet. Jesus' salvation activity affects all of creation. News of his victory won on the cross can never be silenced. In a world where it can so easily seem as though evil dominates, where men and women, but mainly men, manipulate power for their own ends, where those of faith can be cruelly persecuted, we constantly need to remember that Christ has come to earth, that he has won the victory, a humble victory on a cross. And one day, one day all of creation will proclaim that Jesus is indeed the one sent by God, that he is Lord. Most of the people of Jerusalem, I suspect even those who cheered him into the city, did not really understand that Jesus was the Messiah. The little cavalcade coming across along the road was an exciting distraction for a time, but no more than that. And so Luke tells that as Jesus came nearer to the city, he looked over it, And he wept. Jesus could be emotional at times. As he predicted that before long, Jerusalem and particularly the temple would be destroyed, it reduced him to tears. You did not recognize the time when God came to save you, he said. I wonder, might it be that there are times Jesus weeps over us as we fail to understand his time in our lives, as we fail to recognize who he really is and how we must live for him. So often, We are distracted by the events going on in the world around us. But you know, they're only transitory. The victory of Jesus in the world is permanent. Indeed, it's eternal. And it affects all of creation. Jesus invites us to live for him. If we ignore his invitation then perhaps he will weep. Not for himself, but for our lost opportunity to acknowledge him as Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, may we always recognize you and always Acknowledge your son. There is so much in life that distracts us, but may we never fail to live as he has called us and to follow him. Amen.
Now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forever. Amen.